Welcome everybody, good morning. The um, Welcome to the paper session on point clouds. We have some echo. Let's say, can you, can you turn it off? Anyway, I just continue and maybe we have the echo. So, um, so in this paper session, we will have three papers. Um, the paper videos will be streamed on the YouTube channel and the audience can send me questions either through the Discord channel, this is the FP2 point clouds channel, or through the uh, YouTube chat window. I will do my best and observe both um, text chat windows, collect the questions, and ask them to the, um, to the authors after the video. So the first paper, um, the title is Persistence Analysis of multiple multi-scale planar structure graph in point clouds. It's uh, co-authored by Thibaut Lechembel, Claudio Mura, Loic Bart, and uh, Nicolas Melado. The talk will be given by Thibaut, and I think we can just start and play the video. Hello everyone and welcome in this talk about persistence analysis of multi-scale planar structure graph in point clouds. This work I'm going to present has been done in collaboration with Claudio Mura, Loïc Bart, Nicolas Melado and myself, Thibault Lejambl, from the University of Toulouse. This research work focuses on the analysis of 3D and structured point clouds that come from 3D scans. Also, such point clouds are very simple to define. It's just a discrete set of 3D coordinates. They remain quite challenging to process due to multiple reasons, like acquisition artifacts and the large number of points they contain. But more importantly, scanned shapes tend to be very complex. To illustrate this, let's take one point of the roof tiles here and ask ourselves what shape it belongs to. Is it a very small horizontal plane representing the tiles or a medium-sized plane representing the roof? Or maybe the entire house is just one detail we don't want to pay attention to if we are looking at this point cloud from very far. We observe in point clouds with a lot of samples that features have indeed very different sizes and different shapes can be assigned to one single point. This actually depends on the scale of observation we use. So our goal in this work is to take into account this notion of scale to find planar regions in complex 3D point clouds. If we look at existing methods, several algorithms have been proposed to find planar primitives. Some of them use region growing, others are stochastic, like the famous Ransac methods, or they often involve optimization procedures to fit planes to point clouds. Another category of methods extract structures. They focus on how planes are organized with respect to each other. Overall, all of these methods work at one single particular scale, sometimes specified by one or several parameters that are not easy to set. With these methods, for instance, it will be challenging to extract simultaneously both the tiles and the roof of our house. There is one method of Fang and its colleague that is related to our problem. In this technique, they progressively merge planes obtained from another segmentation of the point cloud. Then, they learn what is a pertinent configuration of planes and extract a set of them that they called structural scales. But first, since it relies on machine learning, user annotated data are required, which is usually not easy to get, and also the scale is not explicitly defined, as the result depends on the greedy sequence of merging operations. In order to define properly a scale of analysis, the scale space framework of signal processing can be considered. The basic idea is to convolve an image with a Gaussian kernel of increasing size and look at curvature extrema along the smoothing process. 
extrema that persist at high scale are likely to be a feature like an edge or a corner in an image. This has also been extended to 3D meshes and point clouds by varying the number of closest neighbors used to calculate the surface variation, as we can see in the bottom right here. And recently, this framework has been used together with point set surfaces methods, often used in point cloud rendering and processing. In this case, the scale is the size of the smoothing kernel. It's a very intuitive definition of a scale, as it's a distance in the ambient space, and that's why we adopt this kind of scale space approach in this work. Now, let me illustrate our approach on this simple 2D wavy curve and its continuous scale space curvature below. The x-axis is the parameterization of the curve, the y-axis is the scale, and colors represent the sign curvature. We remark areas with the same colors, corresponding to locations sharing the same curvature. So at low scale, there's a lot of these areas, which corresponds to the high frequency of the curve, and at the top, at high scale, we only have one region with zero curvature, which corresponds to the average straight line of the curve. So we have three different scales in this example. Our goal is to find these areas that are stable in both scale and space, which are the meaningful planar regions on the 3D shape. To achieve this, we take a discrete approach, where we first group horizontally spatial locations with the same differential property. This gives lots of independent regions, represented with arbitrary colors here, and it's clear that there are repetitions. Several regions are actually the same at different scales. So the next step will be to look at these similar regions from scale to scale, in order to obtain the final stable regions in scale and space. To do so, we developed a new method composed of four main steps that I will detail just after this Briof overview, using this simple point cloud as illustration. The first step reconstruct the point cloud using a scale space approach, so that the shape is smoother and smoother. In the second step, we perform segmentations to group points that have similar differential property at each scale. We construct in the third step a graph to organize all of these segmentations and link similar regions together. And finally, we extract the meaningful planar regions that hold at several scales as individual components in the graph. Then, I will describe several applications using our method. The scale is the radius of the Euclidean neighborhood used to compute differential properties. So we define a scale interval going from the local point spacing, a very small distance, to the whole point cloud size. And then we sample m scales between, where m is equal to 50 in all our experiments. Then for each scale, we calculate the algebraic point set surfaces where the weighting kernel of the APSS is equal to the scale. With this fast point set surfaces method, we are able to calculate normals and curvatures that get smoother as the scale grows. To group points with a similar differential property, we perform a seeded region growing over the k-nearest neighbor graph of the point cloud. Seeds are located at points with low curvature and the region grows from point to point if the angle between the normals is below a given threshold. Finally, we discard every region smaller than the current scale by looking at the 2D alpha shape of the planar region. We do that independently at every scale, giving us several segmentations with different regions that we need to link together. Here on the right, we see only four scales, where colors are arbitrary at each level. All of these 50 segmentations are turned into a hierarchical graph. One level of scale corresponds to one level in the graph, and one region is represented by one node. Then we create edges between regions at successive scales. To find correspondences between regions, we use the jacquard index. It calculates the sum of points shared by the two regions over the sum of points in their union. So it is only combinatorial, we only count points, and it is bounded between 0 and 1, where 1 means that regions are perfectly the same. An important property of this graph is that given a node and all of these edges that go toward the next level, there is 0 or 1 edge with a Jacan index strictly greater than 0 0.5. Therefore, if we only connect edges with a Jacquard index greater than 0 0.5, we obtain a simpler graph composed of sequences of nodes across scales. 
In this new graph, colors are now consistent at any level of scale. These components, like this one in red, go from a birth level at their lower scale to a death level at their higher scale. The persistence of such components is then defined by the number of levels between its birth and death levels. So for instance, if we take the union of all of these red regions, we obtain this plane in red here. And if we look at the most persistent one, in blue, we obtain the base plane of the point cloud. And actually, these birth and death levels can be represented appropriately as a point in a diagram. Persistent diagrams come from topological data analysis. The x-coordinate is the birth scale and the y-coordinate is the death scale of a component. So a point on the diagonal is a region that appears at one level of scale and directly disappears at the next one, like a noisy area. On the contrary, points far from the diagonal, on the top left corner of the diagram, are components highly stable with a large difference between birth and death levels. So it means that the associated region is present on the detail point cloud as well as on the smooth one. So this is a good way to robustly find planes on point clouds. Other operations are also possible, like looking at regions only in a certain range of scale, in order to focus only on details at low scale, or on more global shapes at high scale. Plus, we can easily compare components by looking at the distance between their points in this diagram. For the results, let's first have a look at this more complex synthetic example. With this first threshold, we only discard the tiny planes on the side of the small steps. A higher threshold discards all of the small steps. And with a higher threshold, we keep only the main planes that persist more along the smoothing process. Note that the blue and orange planes are the most persistent components of the scene. These three different thresholds on persistence clearly highlight different type of planar structures in the point cloud. On a real world examples, thresholding on persistence allows us to extract different types of elements from small alcoves on facades to the main roof of this church. It is also possible to interactively select a range of scales to control the level of details of the segmentation. Small tiles or entire roof planes are segmented depending on this unique and intuitive scale threshold. If we look at the first point cloud shown in this presentation, we can extract the small tiles or the roof by specifying two different thresholds, or we can only consider the ground at a higher scale. Comparing components is also possible. If a user selects one component on the point cloud, we can automatically select similar components in a region of interest that have approximately the same birth and death levels. So as we can see, closed points in a persistent diagram usually correspond to similar planar shapes. And with our tool, it is easy to interactively select multiple regions on point clouds for real-time reconstruction, for instance. We are also able to propose to the user several most persistent components if the first selected one is not wanted. Here the user changes from the roof component to the tile component. Together with the comparison tool, it makes interactive point selection more intuitive and allows us to use more complex data. We did a comparison with Fransac and Raptor that detect planes at a single scale and with the structural scale technique that produces planes at three scales. So we selected four of our segmentations using thresholds and scale. We obtain as much plane as Ransac in our highest scale, and our lowest scale contains only the four main planes of the buildings. In this comparison, all other methods target 80% of coverage, while our method lets the segmentation adapt to the shape itself. Since our final planes are union of regions obtained using region growing, the root mean square error of the method is particularly low. In terms of processing time, our method takes around 6 minutes to process 1 million points, while structural scale and raptor are slower. Also note that 90% of the time of our method is spent in the APSS reconstruction. Segmentations and components extraction on the graph take actually less than a minute. In our paper, we provide more results on even more complex point clouds, like this tower containing more than 30 millions of points. We can handle various kinds of data in indoor or large-scale outdoor scenes 
with point clouds coming from different acquisition sources like LiDAR or MultiView Stereo. We also show that our results can be used to improve polygonal surface reconstruction in order to obtain various clean and abstract models from 3D point clouds. To summarize, we propose a new method to find planes in complex point clouds. Planes are detected by finding stable regions that persist while the shape is smoothed. Simple region growing first groups points with similar normals at each scale, and then similar regions are connected in a graph, and the most persistent ones correspond to meaningful planes. The main advantage is that many different scales are taken into account, and our method is also robust to real scan artifacts and has good performance. We are thinking about several extensions for future work. Right now, our method is restricted to planes. Real-world entities can be approximated by planes, but for some applications, it can be interesting to consider other types of primitives, as spheres, cones, and cylinders. Not that except for the planar segmentations, where a geometric criterion is used, our method is mostly combinatorial. The graph, the jacquard index for similarity, components and their persistence are not linked to the type of primitive. Finally, we think that our graph representation could be further used for point cloud processing, especially to help users to interact with massive 3D point clouds. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Tipo, thank you for the talk. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so the, for the audience, if you have questions for Thibaut, please post them either in the Discord channel or uh, in the YouTube chat window. And so I just see one. Um, is there a heuristic or experimental experience on how to choose the area that is disregarded in the persistence diagram? Thibaut, do you have an answer for that? Um, so first, I hope you can hear me well. So tell me if not. Uh, so the question is, is there an heuristic on how to choose the area that is disregarded in the persistence diagram? Uh, so basically, yeah, we, the idea of the persistence diagram is that so points that are uh, very close to the diagonal will correspond to noise in the 3D shape. So this is the first uh, basic idea on how to uh, discard a lot of points in this diagram to uh, only uh, conserve the stable parts of the shape uh, that are on the top left corner of the diagram. So this is the main idea of this diagram. Uh, but again, we have to choose this threshold, uh, this distance to the diagonal to discard the points. So this is the main idea. <coughs> okay. Um... So since I don't see any other question, let me ask the question. Um, okay, just Paolo posted a question. Um, it's robust to noise. Um, how robust is it to large sampling density? Uh, you mean when the density is, there is a strong variation of density? Yes, or it's not dense. So it's like sparse in regions and dense in others, yeah. Well, the, the good thing is that at very high scale, when the, the neighborhood we use to compute uh, the surface and so on, at high, high scale, this neighborhood is very large, so we can uh, gather a lot of points. So even if the sampling is very low, uh, at low scale, we don't have uh, any information, but at high scale, we will be able to detect if it's a plane or not. Uh, so this is uh, robust in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. What would be your idea to extend this to primitives that are not planes? Um, so yeah, as I said at the end of the talk, it could be um, a good idea to extend uh, to different primitives. Uh, one advantage is that all the graph parts is only combinatorial, so we don't rely on the plane itself. Uh, we just have region and we compare them in terms of number of points that are shared between region and so on. 
uh, and all the persistence diagram will, will be the same if we, we handle sphere and cylinder, for instance. Uh, the challenge will be to first define a, a segmentation, to first extract uh, spheres and cones uh, everywhere on the point clouds. Uh, so this is uh, the first things to do. Uh, and then the challenge will be to handle, uh, because here we have only one type of primitive, so we have only one type of node in the graph and so on. So maybe it will be more complex to, to process uh, different type of primitives. Uh, maybe the challenge will be yeah, to, to determine if a point is on a sphere or not. Uh, we have several choice, uh, choices to make. Uh, so yeah, this is to investigate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There seems to be no other question in the YouTube chat, no other question in the Discord. Um, let me ask one, one more. Um, so now you detect primitives in, in the point cloud, but there are also points that do not belong to any primitive that you that are marked black in, in, in your rendings that you just discard. Um, would it be useful and would you see any way to do like a, a partitioning of the whole point cloud? Something like this variational shape approximation where you do a partition so there's no point that is unassigned. Every point is assigned to some primitive. Is that useful or, or is, it, is it not? Or, and if it's useful, do you have an idea how to do it? So when we observe that in very large scale point clouds with a strong noise and a lot of variation in the sampling and so on. Uh, it's sometimes weird to force a full partitioning because a lot of points are not really well determined. Uh, they are here, but sometimes it's just how we acquire the, the point cloud that creates uh, outliers and so on. So forcing like 80% uh, of coverage is, is something we can do, but um, in a lot of point clouds, it's not very pertinent, I think. Um, so that's why our method can adapt to these kind of points, because a lot of points are discarded uh, by default uh, by the method. Uh, so we don't have outliers and unnecessary points. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Andreas asked on, on the YouTube chat whether your code is available. Uh, so right now, no, it's not uh, available. Um, but we may think to to make it public in the future. Please do so. That would be great. OK. <laughs> OK, I see no more questions. Then uh, thanks a lot, Thibaut. Nice talk. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, for answering the questions. And then we move on to the, <coughs> to the uh, second presentation in this session. Um, the title is Point Clean Net, Learning to Denoise and Remove Outliers from Dense Point Clouds. That's a CGF paper that is presented here at uh, Eurographics. The authors are uh, Marie-Juli Rakotosauna, Vittorio Le <coughs> Barbara, Paul Guerrero, Guerrero, Loimitra and Max Ovsianikov. And um, I think we just jump right into the video. Welcome to this talk about point clean net, learning to denoise and remove outliers from dense point clouds. We are interested in cleaning noisy data that come from various scanning methods. Our problem consists in two main steps. First, given a noisy point cloud with outliers, we want to remove the outlier points. Then we will move the remaining points onto the underlying clean surface. Cleaning noisy point clouds is an important problem because most of the time, the data that we get from different scanning methods such as image-based reconstruction or 3D scanners like Kinect are extremely noisy and need to be cleaned before being exploited or reconstructed into meshes. Previous methods on outlier classification often rely on estimating statistical features from local patches of points. For example, given the density of points inside a patch, we can estimate whether the center point is an outlier or not. However, the choice of the method 
and parameters will often depend on the type of noise in the data. Similarly, existing methods for denoising rely on estimating local surfaces inside the patch of points. Some methods even use additional information, such as normals or the color of the point, to get more precise estimation of the surface. Here again, the choice of the parameters, like the patch size, will depend on the noise characteristic of the data. For example, if the patch is too small, then high-frequency noise can lead to unreliable measures. On the other hand, a method with a very large patch can oversmooth surfaces and lose important details. We propose a method that is robust to different kinds and levels of noise. Our method does not need any parameter tuning and can be adapted to structured noise from specific acquisition methods. Our method is inspired by the remarkable results of recent learning methods such as PointNet. They operate on tasks that rely on global analysis of the shape, such as classification and segmentation. Given an input point cloud, PointNet will first learn an independent per point feature. After that, it will aggregate this information into a global feature vector using a symmetric function, such as max pooling. For each point cloud, it can output a class, but also a part label for each point. Since we have to input the entire point cloud, this kind of method is often very expensive in terms of memory. Using dense point clouds, which we are interested in, can be really challenging in this setting. Moreover, they also need a large number of shapes for training. The global point net approach has also been extended to analyze local shape properties by analyzing local patches around points rather than the entire point cloud. For example, PCPNet is a method that has been proposed to compute oriented normals and curvatures for point cloud. Given a small patch of points around the center point, they learn a local feature at that point. Note that this method also has the advantage of requiring fewer shapes in training since they can use multiple patches from one point cloud. Like for computing normals, our problem can be solved by looking at the local neighborhood around each point. As we have seen before, PointNet inputs an entire point cloud into the network. In our setting, we only input a small patch from which we estimate the local features. We build our patch by selecting a fixed number of points in a sphere of radius r and centered at the point we compute the features from. Each patch is then normalized and centered at the origin. Unlike existing methods, the quality of the approximation is not directly related to the size of the patch. While statistical features are computed from all the points in the patch in other methods, our learning-based pipeline does not necessarily consider all the regions inside the patch to estimate features. In other words, if multiple levels or characteristics of noise exist in the dataset, point cleanet can specifically adapt to it. In summary, the pipeline of point clean net contains two main blocks. First, we use the outliers detector to remove outlier points. Then, we use the denoiser to move the points onto the clean surface. Given a noisy patch with outliers, the outlier detector will output the probability of the center point to be an outlier. For training, we use a simple L1 loss between the ground truth label and the predicted output. Here, we present the exact architecture of our outlier removal network. The architecture is very similar to the one for PointNet or PCPNet. Given the normalized local patch, we first apply a spatial transformer network that is constrained to rotations. This is a small sub-network that learns to rotate the patch to a canonical orientation. Then, we apply the feature extractor 
to each point of the patch. A symmetric operation combines the features into a global patch feature. Finally, a regressor outputs the probability of the center point being an outlier. With our outliers detector, we can now remove the outlier points from the point cloud and pass it as input of the denoiser. Like for the outlier detector, we input a patch centered at point PI to the denoiser network. It will then output a displacement vector DI that moves the noisy point onto the clean surface. For training, we use a loss that minimizes the distance to the clean ground truth point cloud. We minimize the squared distance between the denoised center point and the closest clean ground truth point in the patch. The architecture for denoising point clouds is the same as the outlier removal network. However, instead of computing a single feature, we output the coordinates of the displacement vector. At the end of the pipeline, the estimated vectors are rotated back from the canonical orientation computed by the spatial transformer towards space. Then, they are added to the original coordinates. After one iteration of denoising all the points in the point cloud, we noticed that some residual noise remains. This is due to the fact that neighbor patches output estimates that are often inconsistent between themselves. To counteract this effect, we apply our denoising pipeline iteratively. We also notice that slightly non-uniform point distribution can be highly intensified after multiple iterations. As you can see on the left, after some time, the points drift tangentially on the surface to form clusters. We therefore need a regularization term that will encourage the point distribution to be more uniform even after multiple iterations. We use a loss that minimizes the distance between the denoised center point and the farthest clean point from the ground truth patch. We use this loss as a regularization. Intuitively, this keeps the clean point centered in the patch and discourages the drift of the point tangent to the surface. Our final loss is a weighted loss between LS that we previously described and the regularization loss. In this equation, we use an alpha of 0 0.99. Finally, the last challenge we were faced with is one that is also frequent in smoothing methods like Laplacian smoothing. After some iterations of denoising, the denoised point cloud tend to shrink. Indeed, our distance-based losses tend to be minimized if we put the points closer to each other. This is especially true near sharp features. At each denoising step, we introduce a corrected displacement vector that will prevent the shape from shrinking. This step is inspired from Thomas' moving method. This method consists in iteratively denoising the shape and inflating it back using corrective vectors in the opposite direction. In point cleanet, we use the same idea by building a corrective displacement vector that we will apply in only one step. Our method subtracts a vector that is averaged from displacement vectors of the neighborhood to the center point displacement vector. Intuitively, the negative average vector from the neighborhood will inflate the shape, while the original displacement vector will clean the point cloud. For training the different models, we use the same dataset as the one used in PCPNet. It contains 18 training shapes and 10 test shapes. For our outlier removal model, we sample 140,000 points from each match. Among those, we replace between 10 and 90% of the points by synthetic outlier points. We produce these points by adding Gaussian noise of a standard deviation of 20% of the shape's bounding box diagonal to the original clean points. 
After training the model, we test it on a test set containing this caution noise, but also uniformly distributed outlier points inside a larger pointing box around the shape. In the test set, we have inlier points that are clean, but also different levels of smaller Gaussian noise that we describe later. We train our denoising model by sampling 100k points from different meshes. We then apply six different levels of Gaussian noise from 0% to 2.5% of the bounding box diagonal of the shapes to the sampled points. To conclude, we can train our model on 18 shapes with six different levels of noise and 100k different patches. So around 10 million training patches. We then test the train model on the 10 remaining shapes that haven't been seen during training. On this slide, we see an example of the six different levels of noise on the shape from the training set. The noise levels go from 0% to 2.5%. We compare our pipeline to different state-of-the-art methods. For jet fitting and edge aware, we use three different parameterization that correspond to different size of patches. We use these methods as they are implemented in SIGAL. We also compare our method to two learning baselines that we modify from state-of-the-art learning methods. Dynamic Graph CNN and Point Per Net. As Dynamic Graph CNNs were not designed for denoising, we modified the segmentation variant of this method to output a displacement vector per point instead of class probabilities. Since the whole point cloud is processed in a single go, we need to heavily subsample our dense point clouds before using them as input. We also restrict Dynamic Graph CNN to a single iteration as we found the results tend to diverge after iteration. Here, we show the performance of our model compared to these methods. We first compare the denoising step of PointlyNet on the denoising dataset without outliers. We see that some methods are more adapted to small levels of noise. Other methods, like EdgeAware with a medium patch size, work well on larger levels of noise. Finally, some methods work on even larger levels of noise, but lose too much details on the shape. On the other hand, our method remains among the best on every levels of noise, so pointly net is more robust to large changes of noise levels in the dataset. On this figure, we show the results of our denoising method on man-made shapes with high levels of noise. Some methods such as bilateral smoothing or dynamic graph CNN do not perform well with these noisy point clouds. On the second row, Edgeware method has higher error near the sharp features while our method preserves them. On more natural shapes, jet or Everywhere methods struggle to preserve detailed regions like near the shoulders of the Buddha. We compare the performance of our complete pipeline of outlier removal and denoising on the outlier removal test set. We compare our outlier removal method to the one from SIGA. We show the evolution of the F1 and F2 scores over the noise levels in the test set. The F1 and F2 scores measure the accuracy of the different methods. Therefore, in the best case, we would have an accuracy of 1. We see that while our method does not perform as well as the competing method with respect to the F1 score, it surpasses the other methods on the F2 score which we are more interested in. Indeed, the F2 score gives more weight to the recall than to the precision. Intuitively, 
A higher F2 score means that there are fewer false negatives. In our case, since we work with dense point clouds, we are more interested in correctly labeling the outlier points, even if we end up removing a few noisy points from the point cloud. On this figure, we show the results of our outlier removal method followed by 10 iterations of denoising. We see that having a higher F2 score leads to cleaner point clouds since we have less outlier points remaining. Here, we test our entire pipeline on shapes from our dataset on the left, but also on real shapes from datasets provided in recent benchmarks. We test on point clouds from image-based reconstruction and from the tanks and temple dataset. As I mentioned earlier, our architecture can be trained directly on a dataset with specific structured noise. We build a synthetic LIDAR dataset using the scanner simulator Blenser. LIDAR data presents specific distance bias between rays on top of per ray Gaussian noise. After retraining and testing our pipeline on this dataset, we see that our method correctly denoise the distance bias on the top, but also the distance bias with noise. Using the same simulator, we also build a dataset of misaligned scans. We train our model on misaligned scans and two different Kinect datasets. On this structured dataset, our model trained on the original one remains competitive. However, our retrained models outperforms all of the state-of-the-art methods on the Kinect V1 and misaligned scan test sets. To conclude, Point CleanNet is a simple framework for cleaning point clouds that does not need any tuning of the parameters. It is robust to different levels and types of noise and can be adapted to specific data from different scanning methods. One limitation of our method is that we need a pairing between the noisy point clouds and the ground truth clean ones. Since we published the paper, some methods such as total denoising achieve similar results using unsupervised learning. We could also use our architecture on different applications like super resolution of point clouds. Our code is available on GitHub where you can clean point clouds directly using our pre-trained models, but also train new models on new datasets. Our datasets with noise and outliers are available on GitHub and can also be accessed via our page. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for this nice presentation. Um, again, for the audience, if you have questions for this paper, please post the questions in the Discord channel or in the YouTube chat. Um, and then we will now move to the to the Q and A. And there has been already one um, one question. So the Question is, is it really necessary to apply a learning scheme just to rotate the patch? Couldn't the rotation into a generic position also be done by PCA or similar? So, thank you for your question. Um, so it's true that we could have used PCA, but for example, on detailed patches, um, it is not always clear what is the canonical orientation that you could have computed with the network vs uh, what you would have had with PCA, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, a second question was posted, how long does it take to train the model? Can you give some example numbers? 
Um, so we don't have exact numbers, but uh, it would take around, around one day to train with a, a 12 giga GPU. Mm -hmm. the, um, so how much do the results depend on your training data? So did, did you try like different variations um, of noise in the training data, different characteristics of noise? Do you have some feeling about that? So do you mean if we could adapt the method to a test set that is different to the training set? Um, yeah, that would be one, one question. Or like, would the method improve a lot if you add more training data with more uh, different characteristics of noise or different characteristics of outliers or did you have enough training data? I see. So um, we tested something like that with different data sets, which are the ones from Kinect, for example. So we tested the model that was trained on the original data set with uh, Gaussian noise. And compared to the other methods, it was already very good. But mm -hmm. there are still some methods that were not as good as our method. And if it is retrained on the new specific data set, then it's, um, it, it is better than all of the baselines. Uh, one more question was posted in the Discord. Uh, could you explain um, how you choose the number of iterations? Um, so, in general, we would run the network on our test set and see how much it, um, it deviates from the ground truth. So, on the test set, we have ground truth to um, compute the evaluation. And from, then, from that, we can see how many iterations we need. Are there any other questions from the audience? How did you apply this technique on LiDAR data? So what are the differences observed? So um, we built a data set using the Blenser simulator, which simulates the LiDAR data. And um, we did not really see any difficulties since we trained the model on this data and it uh, gave good results. Okay. Any more questions? I'll just wait a couple of seconds since we have some delay but this does not seem to be the case. Um, so thanks, thanks again for this presentation and for answering uh, the questions. And thanks to the audience for asking questions. That works quite well. And then we move on to the third presentation of uh, this session. Um, and this is progressive real-time rendering of one billion points without hierarchical acceleration structures. And the authors are Markus Schütz, um, Gottfried Mandelburger, Johannes Otepka, and uh, Michi Wimmer. And we just um, move on to the video. Hello, I'm Markus, and I'm going to talk about progressive real-time rendering of 1 billion points without a need for hierarchical acceleration structures. Uh, if you're interested, the full source code is available here on GitHub. Uh, the links are also in our paper, and I'm going to show it again at the end of the presentation. So, the issue that we're trying to solve here is that if you want to take a look at large point clouds, what you usually have to do is you have to create a level of detail structure first. The only problem is that generating these kind of structures takes quite a while. So for example, if you have 
400 million points. It usually takes around 400 to 600 seconds until the structure is finished and until you're able to get a look at your data. The goal of our method is to be able to render any kind of point cloud that fits into view memory in real time without having to do this in advance. So you can load these things from disk and uh, you can look at them as fast as you can load them from an SSD. So let me just show you a video here of what this looks like. This is a point cloud with 400 million points and even while it's still loading you can already zoom all the way in and look at it, uh, even though it's sequential data without a level of detail structure. And yeah, it's 400 million points. It's usually way too much to run in real time, but with our progressive method here, uh, no problem. Okay, so the idea behind this progressive method here is that instead of doing all the work in a single frame, we're going to distribute it over multiple frames. And that's not a new idea, it's already used in ray tracing. There's also previous work on point cloud rendering where they apply this to hierarchical uh, level of detail structures. We're trying to bring the same thing to sequential, non-processed point cloud data. And the first thing we do in a frame is uh, we're going to reproject the data that's already previously rendered because this data here from the previous frame this is very likely to be visible again in the current frame uh, because usually we have very slight transformation and uh, after reprojection it looks like this here. And the only problem is that there are some disocclusions. So this data here is part of the building that wasn't visible previously. So what we have to do is we have to fill this somehow. And uh, in the second pass, the fill pass, we're trying to fill this missing data by rendering a random selection of points here. In the final pass, the prepare pass, we are going to take all the points that are now visible at the end of the frame and store them into a vertex buffer. And this vertex buffer is what's going to be rendered again in the first pass of the next frame. And if you repeat this a couple of times, uh, eventually this method will progress towards the full result here. So um, why do we add random points in each frame? So when we add random points, uh, when we don't add random points, it looks like this here. Uh, you get this very annoying popping artifacts, and that is because in each frame after a transformation, you have a lot of holes, and because the points are sorted in some way, you end up filling some holes in one frame, some more holes in the next frame, but there are always a huge amount of holes that are only filled after. Uh, 10 frames or so, so in the meantime you get this popping artifacts. On the other hand, if you randomize the vertex buffer, it will look like this here. So we still do have some rendering artifacts, especially on the border of the screen, but now you get, don't get this annoying popping artifacts. Okay, so how do we render these random points? Uh, what we're doing is we're just shuffling the vertex buffer. And with a shuffled vertex buffer, all we have to do is render subsets of this vertex buffer in order to render a selection of random points. Now, this means that shuffling is actually quite a huge part of our method here, and it has to be very fast. And to make it fast, we're using this kind of permutation function here. This function, it takes a prime that is concurrent to three mod four, and what it does is it creates a permutation of numbers between zero and this prime here. So what we have to do is we have to find a prime that is very close to the number of points we have, and then we can permute our point cloud using this function here. And the nice part of the, about this function here is that it has no collisions and it doesn't depend on previous states. So we can do this, we can apply this to all points at once with no collisions, no syncing necessary, no atomics, and this is why this shuffling here is pretty fast. Um, we do this directly in the computer on the GPU. Another important aspect of our method is the fill budget. So we have this recheck pass, we have the fill pass, and we have the prepare pass. And the first and the third pass, all they really do is to preserve the detail that we've already rendered. But the second pass, the fill pass, this is the one that drives the progress towards convergence. So what we have to do is, we have to run as many points as we can in the fill pass, 
expect to increase the conversion speed, but we also have to make sure that we still achieve real-time frame rates. Uh, relatively low fill budgets are about 1 million points per frame in the fill pass. Uh, relatively high budgets are something around 30 million points per frame. So this is something that uh, depends on the speed of your GPU and it also depends on uh, the viewpoint in your scene. So even if you have the same number of points, uh, it's, it takes a very different amount of time to render the same number of points. So let's take a look at this here. The, this video will show you uh, at first a moderate field budget of 10 million points. So when you move around you get full result pretty quickly. And then if you reduce this fill budget here very sharply and go to a new region, you can see how it converges, how it progresses in a relatively uniform way all over the screen because of this randomization of the, uh, because of the shuffling of the point buffer. So only problem with this, with a fill pitch fixed budget, uh, fill budget is that uh, if you just render 1 million points, then you're wasting a lot of time on a high-end GPU. On the other hand, if you render 30 million points, it won't really work on a low-end GPU. So what we need is some kind of adaptive fill budget that automatically adjusts the number of points that you render. And we do this directly on the GPU. The, and the first thing we do in each frame is we render 1 million points. And then in a the compute shader, we measure how long did it take to render this 1 million points. And based on that, we can estimate how many more we can, uh, points we can render this frame. And yeah, then we can just render this uh, remaining number uh, with an indirect draw call. And since all of that is done on the GPU, there is no syncing to the CPU and uh, this runs quite fast. So uh, another consideration for our method. Uh, what do we do with point clouds that have a large number of point attributes? The issue here is that with each attribute, the number of bytes per point increases considerably. And uh, we've had point clouds with uh, around 100 bytes per point, which uh, is about, so imagine you have 100 million points, it's already about 10 gigabytes. Now, we've been claiming that our method can render any number of points that fit on GPU memory in real time. But it's not a very exciting claim if we can only fit, fit uh, 100 million points in CPU memory. So what we do is we really only send the position and one attribute to the GPU. So we only need 16 bytes per point. And that way we can fit quite a lot of points in the GPU. Uh, on our 2080 with 11 gigabytes, uh, we can comfortably fit and render 500 million points. And on a Titan RTX with 24 gigabytes, we were able to render 1 billion points uh, directly in real time. Uh, now, we don't just want to render this one attribute here. Sometimes we want to switch attribute to another one. And to do this, we have to stream a new attribute on demand. So if the user sa uh, says we want to render intensity now, uh, so in that case, we then have to stream this new attribute from CPU to GPU memory. And in order to do this efficiently, we keep attributes in a structure of arrays memory layout. This means that uh, each array consists only a single attribute. And uh, this means that when we're sending new data, we don't have to filter out data that we don't need or we don't have to send data that we don't need. Uh, using this kind of structure, we are able to stream around 300 to 800 million points per second or the attribute data of that many points per second to the GPU. And since this data on the CPU is not shuffled or, uh, yet, we have to shuffle it again. And since shuffling is pretty much a no-op, this works comfortably with 800 million points per second. Uh, not also that the attribute that we're sending, it doesn't have to be just one single attribute. Uh, you can also combine multiple attributes into a single attribute, uh, as long as it fits into four bytes. Uh, although you can also implement it with more bytes, we just try to fit it in 16 bytes uh, in total on each point. So let's take a look at what this looks like here. So when we're switching attributes, it's not instant, it takes a couple of frames until this is finished, but uh, considering that this is not done on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, but rather when a user says he wants to see a different attribute, this is usually fine. 
of course, you won't be able to, uh, uh, to to do some kind of shading that requires a combination of a lot of attributes or filtering that does, uh, needs a lot of uh, different attributes. But as long as you just need a limited amount of attributes, this is working quite well. Okay, uh, yeah, another claim, of course, that we've done is that uh, this helps us to look at files much, much faster than if we'd have to generate an LOD structure before. So what we're also trying to do is to load uh, point cloud data as fast as we can from disk. And one of the most widely used and popular point cloud formats is uh, the LAS format, which uh, is a wide, yeah, it's very widely, very popular. Only problem is that it uses different kind of memory structure. So it stores points in a structure of arrays layout, no, it, in an arrays of struct layout, and we have to convert it to the structure of arrays layout. Uh, yeah, in order to do that, we dedicate one thread to loading the data from an SSD and three more threads are needed to uh, pass this data and transform it to, a to the desired layout. Using that, those four threads together, we achieve around a uh, throughput of around 40 million points per second, uh, which is quite acceptable. So and here we can see a diagram of what this looks like. Um, we also pr operate in batches so that we never have to wait too long so one can always r maintain responsiveness. So we can see this load thread here. It loads a batch, the next batch, and the next batch, and then the pass threads, they grab an available batch, do this parsing, and when they're finished, the main thread will send the finished batch to the GPU. Uh, it's important that the main thread never waits for this data. It also always checks, is it already available? And if it's not available, it just checks again next frame, but it's not never waiting. Okay, so uh, 40 million points per second is nice, but we tried to reach 100 million points per second as well, just because it sounds nice. And the SSD we're using, it uh, achieves around 2.5 gigabytes per second. If our point cloud data only has colors, uh, it will need about 1.6 gigabytes per second, so 100 million points. So this is something that's actually quite easy to achieve these 100 million points per second if the file format matches the vertex buffer format. And in that case, we just load the data again in batches and send it off to the GPU and that's it. That way you can maintain 60 frames per second and uh, yeah, always making sure that we load this in batches of 500,000 points each. Uh, of course we were also checking if this whole thing works in virtual reality and we were able to maintain frame rates of 90 frames per second or 2 times 90 frames per second because we have to render the left eye and the right eye separately at a frame buffer size of 1400 times 1600 pixels and also with multi-sample anti-aliasing enabled because anti-aliasing is uh, really mandatory for virtual reality especially if you're rendering point clouds because point clouds are very prone to aliasing artifacts. So yeah, we were able to do this on an RTX 2080 Ti. Uh, only problem is we were not able to get an adaptive budget working properly. So instead we uh, settled with a fixed budget of 3 million points per frame, which means we it converges at a rate of uh, 180 million points per frame, since it's 3 million points times 90 frames per second. Uh, while moving around in virtual reality, while looking around, you still get this uh, progression artifacts. So you don't have the full data immediately. Instead, it starts out uh, slowly and then adds some additional points each and every frame. And it turns out that in VR, this is actually not that bad. So it's an artifact, a rendering artifact, but at the same time, it also kind of looks cool. So yeah, works in VR, uh, will work even better when it's done in with level of detail structures at a later point. Regarding performance, um, we let, let, sh let me just show you here a data set with 280 million points. And if you're rendering this with a brute force approach, uh, this takes us around 85 million milliseconds per frame. So, which is a frame rate of roughly 12 frames per second. And this is pretty awful. We have our progressive method where we re only render a couple of the data each frame. Uh, so in this case, 10 million points per frame we reach performance of around 176 frames per second. 
the thing then converges in around 150 milliseconds, which is about double as much as the brute force approach. Uh, on the other hand, you always have this responsiveness. You can always uh, move around in real time. So I think this is a trade-off that is very well worth it. So, conclusion and future work. Uh, let me conclude with another nice property of this approach here. And I think one of the most important properties, uh, which is that uh, progressive rendering methods are much, much better at handling depth complexity than simply LOT methods alone. Uh, and this is because if you're using some level of detail structure to render your point clouds and you have a very high depth complexity model, like this building here with interiors, uh, the problem that arises is that you have to render a whole lot of invisible data. So if you're standing in one room here, you have this, you have the wall that you can see, you also have the wall behind it from the next room, and the next wall, and the next wall, so you have a couple of walls that you're not actually seeing, but you still have to render them. And this takes away a lot of the performance and uh, you might end up having to render 50 million points per frame, which uh, is already too much for medium-sized hardware. However, with progressive rendering, 50 million points uh, doesn't matter all that much. You don't have to render it each and every frame. You can just render 10 million points per frame and do the full work over the, over the course of five frames. Um, this is actually already done by Tredinik et al, who applied this progressive rendering to LOD data. And uh, we are very convinced that this is essential for future point cloud renderers, especially for LOD point cloud renderers. And uh, we are going to implement this in our future point cloud renderers as well, and check if there's some additional work that needs to be done here. So with that, thanks for your attention, and if you want to take a look at the source code, it's available here. Okay, um, Markus, thanks again for this nice presentation. And um, there were a couple of questions um, on the YouTube chat. Let me try to sort them. Um, let's start with uh, questions about the VR. So first, I, I really much like the statement, it's a rendering artifact, but at the same time, it looks cool. <laughs> That's, that's very good. Um, so there was uh, one question, what was the reason for the adaptive budget not working in VR? And maybe in combination with this, uh, you could also answer another question, namely how to um, measure the timing in a compute shader, like the frame time, which is when I understood it correctly, your criterion for the adaptive um, budget. Uh, yeah, so um, to measure the time, what you can do is in OpenShell there are the GL Tama queries, and these queries can write the result directly into a GPU buffer. And you can then use a computator to uh, read the time from this GPU buffer and do something with it. And in our case, we are just computing how many points could we render in this time and how many points can we render in the remaining frame time. Uh, regarding VR, I don't really know why it didn't work in VR. Uh, it just didn't really work out as expected. So we did exactly the same thing, but uh, times got all screwed up. So no idea. OK. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple of technical questions. Um, so one is regarding the, the rendering itself. So you render every. Um, point as a single pixel when I understood it correctly. You do, did not use shading, but it's it's just point and color, right? Right. Um, so then this leads to holes unless your algorithm is converged. Um, do you see that it's possible to use deferred shading techniques to close these holes once you zoom in? Um. You could probably use some kind of uh, post-processing shader that does uh, fill the gaps between. We didn't try it yet. Uh, there might be some issue with some kind of temporal uh, appearance. So where in one frame it works nicely, in the next frame it still works nicely for that frame, but in between the frames you get some kind of weird differences that might look bad. 
So this is something that I could imagine could happen. Uh, we haven't really tried that yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when when I was young, people rendered splats and not just points. So like you render a point as a small disk or small ellipse. Um, did you think about that? Because this could also be used to close the holes in between points. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, probably still how uh, what you decide to do is three. Uh, and the kind of data we've got, we don't really know that. So there are no uh, kind of ready information. And um, with the progressive rendering, we also get these holes and this, um, well, this partial filling where the radius of an individual point doesn't really match uh, the holes that appear around it. So um, I think rendering this kind of uh, radius, splats, ellipses might not work all that well with the progressive methods. Do you have some criteria to unload batches of points if they are not used that, that often? Uh, we currently don't unload anything. So we load the full data into CPU and into GPU uh, because the idea was to be able to render any kind of data set that fully fits into GPU. Uh, one of the problems is that the in CPU memory, we have a lot more data because we store all the attributes. So what could be done is to load the data in the CPU memory that you need and all the other attributes that you don't need, you write them into individual files on disk and you can SSD, you can load this super fast and it probably wouldn't even be much slower if you load this from RAM or from disk if it's stored in a nice way. The, I have one question regarding the, the fill um, stage. So when I understood it correctly, you take the points from the last frame and those you will use in, in all the cases. And then you just fill up with random points until your fill budget is full, and then you render those. Um, so how how do you, like when you randomize, do you randomize all the points, or do you randomize just the points you don't have from the previous frame? Or how do you distinguish the points that you add from the points you already have? Um, the so the first thing is we do the reprojection. So we take uh, reprojection all the points that were whistled previously and render them again. And then we add these additional random points. And these random points, we just shuffle the whole vertex buffer. You can shuffle it in any way you want. And then we render different subsets uh, of this shuffled vertex buffer. And because it's shuffled, taking a subset means you basically pick a number of random points for Okay, yeah. Now the the data set it, uh, that you had, just like this Vienna data set, is really cool. And I asked you before, and then this question was also asked in, in the chat: Where does it come from, and is it available? Uh, the data set is captured by V. Uh, it uh, one of our uh, my co-authors, uh, Gottfried Mannburger and Johannes Otzepka, they are working with that, and they also provided it for the previous year, so that we could work on that. Uh, it's not publicly available, unfortunately. Uh, there might be a chance to uh, get it for some kind of research work for a paper, but probably not for public hosting. So if, you, if you're interested in data set, maybe try to uh, write an email to uh, the two co-authors. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, if you have a scan of Vienna, this is beautiful enough by itself, but let's say you scan a city that's not so nice, you want to edit it. So there was one question whether it's possible or whether your approach can be extended to uh, dynamic point, slow, point clouds where you can do the ma some manual editing. Uh, I'm pretty sure it could be extended to have some kind of selection, for example, and then uh, remove whatever you selected, uh, which hasn't happened thought about the details, but I'm very certain that this can be possible. Yeah, since you don't build any fancy data structure, that should be quite easy. Yeah, very good. Yeah, cool. right. It's, it's just that uh, because we don't do all the work in, uh, in each frame, uh, we'd probably also have to do this kind of selecting and removing work over the course of multiple frames, but it should definitely be possible. <clears throat> do we have any other questions from the audience? 
I don't see any other question in the Discord and also no other question in the YouTube uh, channel. Okay, Th thanks a lot, Marcus. So then this concludes the uh, this session and let me thank again all, all the authors and all people in the audience who paid attention and uh, asked nice questions. And let me particularly thank the organizers for making this event possible. They spent an incredible amount of effort and um, like I don't know, we probably cannot imagine how much effort it is. We even had training sessions for the paper chairs not to mess up these sessions and I think we more or less uh, managed to do this. So thanks a lot for the organizers to making this possible and for all other people uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.